In 1866, there was $1.8 billion in currency in circulation in the United States, about $50.46 per capita. In 1867 alone, $500 million was removed from the U.S. money supply. Ten years later, in 1876, America's money supply was reduced to only $600 million. In other words, two-thirds of America's money had been called in by the bankers. Incredibly, only $14.60 per capita remained in circulation. What's so important about how money was withdrawn from the U.S. money supply? Because this is the real cause of depressions, deliberate manipulations of the money supply by big bankers to get what they want politically. On January 28, 2009, the world's business and government leaders met in Davos, Switzerland at the annual World Economic Forum, which they optimistically titled, Shaping the Post-Crisis World, as though someone had already fixed the problem. According to Reuters, the world's largest news service, the world's money supply had nearly been cut in half in the previous 15 months. 40% of the world's wealth was destroyed in the last five quarters. It is an almost incomprehensible number. And how does that compare to the Great Depression of the 1930s? Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman put it this way in his 1996 interview with National Public Radio. The Federal Reserve definitely caused the Great Depression by contracting the amount of currency in circulation by one-third from 1929 to 1933. In other words, by January of 2009, the world's money supply had been contracted more than that which caused the Great Depression in America in the 1930s. Some believe the economic crisis that began in 2008 is still being completely manipulated by the big banks. But it is more likely that their debt money system has finally spiraled out of even their control. In 2008 and 2009, nations poured unprecedented money into the system to prevent its collapse. At the very least, unprecedented inflation will surely follow. And that's the point. It invariably transfers true wealth from the individual to the banks. For if you are unable to pay for your mortgage, they will take your property. This is particularly enraging when you realize that not only is such a default inevitable due to the fractional reserve practice, but also because of the fact that the money that the bank loaned to you didn't even legally exist in the first place. In 1969, there was a Minnesota court case involving a man named Jerome Daly, who was challenging the foreclosure of his home by the bank, which provided the loan to purchase it. His argument was that the mortgage contract required both parties, being he and the bank, each put up a legitimate form of property for the exchange. In legal language, this is called consideration. Mr. Daly explained that the money was, in fact, not the property of the bank, for it was created out of nothing as soon as the loan agreement was signed. Remember what modern money mechanics stated about loans? What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes in exchange for credits. Reserves are unchanged by the loan transactions, but deposit credits constitute new additions to the total deposits of the banking system. In other words, the money doesn't come out of their existing assets. The bank is simply inventing it, putting up nothing of its own except for a theoretical liability on paper. As the court case progressed, the bank's president, Mr. Morgan, took the stand, and in the judge's personal memorandum, he recalled that the plaintiff, bank's president, admitted that, in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank, did create the money and credit upon its books by bookkeeping entry. The money and credit first came into existence when they created it. Mr. Morgan admitted that no United States law or statute existed which gave him the right to do this. A lawful consideration must exist and be tendered to support the note. The jury found that there was no lawful consideration, and I agree. He also poetically added, only God can create something of value out of nothing. And upon this revelation, the court rejected the bank's claim for foreclosure, and Daly kept his home. 
The implications of this court decision are immense. For every time you borrow money from a bank, whether it is a mortgage loan or a credit card charge, the money given to you is not only counterfeit, it is an illegitimate form of consideration and hence voids the contract to repay, for the bank never had the money as property to begin with. Unfortunately, such legal realizations are suppressed and ignored, and the game of perpetual wealth transfer and perpetual debt continues. And this brings us to the ultimate question. Why? During the American Civil War, President Lincoln bypassed the high interest loans offered by the European banks and decided to do what the Founding Fathers advocated, which was to create an independent and inherently debt-free currency. It was called the Greenback. Shortly after this measure was taken, an internal document circulated between private British and American banking interests stated, Slavery is but the owning of labor and carries with it the care of laborers, while the European plan is that capital shall control labor by controlling wages. This can be done by controlling the money. It will not do to allow the greenback, as we cannot control that. The fractional reserve policy perpetrated by the Federal Reserve, which has spread in practice to the great majority of banks in the world, is, in fact, a system of modern slavery. Think about it. Money is created out of debt. And what do people do when they are in debt? They submit to employment to pay it off. But if money can only be created out of loans, how can society ever be debt free? It can't. And that's the point. And it is the fear of losing assets coupled with the struggle to keep up with the perpetual debt and inflation inherent in the system, compounded by the inescapable scarcity within the money supply itself, created by the interest that can never be repaid, that keeps the wage slave in line. Running on the hamster wheel with millions of others, in effect powering an empire that truly benefits only the elite at the top of the pyramid. For, at the end of the day, who are you really working for? The banks. Money is created in a bank and invariably ends up in a bank. They are the true masters, along with the corporations and governments they support. Physical slavery requires people to be housed and fed. Economic slavery requires people to feed and house themselves. It is one of the most ingenious scams for social manipulation ever created, and at its core, it is an invisible war against the population. Debt is the weapon used to conquer and enslave societies, and interest is its prime ammunition. And as the majority walks around oblivious to this reality, the banks, in collusion with governments and corporations, continue to perfect and expand their tactics of economic warfare. I'm here to talk to you about the problem of slavery. It didn't end in the 1860s. It's a social malady that's with us today, and it's increasing in its scope and virulence. The desire to enslave our fellow man is unfortunately intrinsic to the human character. It has been with us since the beginning of time, on every continent and in virtually every culture. From ancient Egypt to Babylon to Greece and Rome, Africa, Asia, Europe, and the United States, Germany and Japan openly practiced widespread slavery only 50 years ago, and the Soviet Union until less than a decade ago, China even today. It's a disease of our human nature, and yet people are under the impression that it no longer exists. I say to you that in a subtle form, it exists in America today, and it's becoming less subtle and more manifest. Madison Avenue has just cleaned it up a little bit, dressed it up in new words. The slave master is now a big brother, someone to protect you, someone to confide in. But it's all the same. He owns your life. Now, this may sound far-fetched, but I think I can prove it. When the IRS allows you a tax deduction, they and their congressional collaborators and the media call it a tax subsidy. In other words, they designate it as a gift to you, a subsidy. The only way they could conceive this terminology is by presupposing that they, i.e. the government, own all the money. Their view is that they're entitled to it all, that which they allow you to keep is their compassionate and generous gift to you. How can this be? 
you create the money by your efforts, your sacrifice, your creativity, your risk taking. So how can it belong to them? It's very simple. They own you. They own everything you produce, your money, your house, your thoughts and ideas, your children. If you go to a foreign country to work, you still have to pay the U.S. income tax. You could dig a hole in the middle of Siberia and they'd be entitled to a cut of your wages because in their minds, under their law, they own you. They create arcane and esoteric laws to criminalize you. You may try, but you can't obey them. You can't even understand them without a lot of professional help. You have to run around slavishly collecting little pieces of paper, receipts, seven years of detailed financial records because you might be called on to give an account of yourself to the big boss man. And if you've made a mistake, he can take everything you have. He loves it that way. That's total power over you, slavery. I don't remember when we the people signed over ownership of ourselves. It just gradually happened by them taking more and more of our freedom. But here's the worst part. It's really only just begun. In this modern age, the information age, getting your money is not enough, even though money, don't let anyone deceive you, is the material source of your freedom. Now, however, they want your mind.